That is definitely a heartbeat of ours. We're going to take our Bibles and turn to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. This year uh, marks now number 10 in evangelism. I don't know how to express and convey the miracle that that is. It's impossible, and it is God. Uh, I've been meditating on a song called Only God, and it is only God that has uh, helped that make that possible. And I'm thankful for the, the call God's placed in my life as an evangelist. I knew since I was 15 years old that God had called me to be an evangelism. I had no clue how that would ever take place. And, uh, and yet God has done such a great work in my life. Uh, you know, in, in ministry, uh, there are a lot of pastors that are able to celebrate 10 years. Uh, of course, our pastors at 30 years this year. And there are a lot of missionaries, uh, many missionaries that celebrate 10 years on the mission field and longer. There are even fewer than that, though, are even youth pastors. I have several youth pastor friends that have served uh, 10 years in, in being a youth pastor at a church. But even fewer than that are evangelists that have served 10 years. Uh, there is a great need for evangelists across our country, across the world. And, uh, and I want to uh, talk a little bit about the evangelist, and then we're going to transition into lessons uh, that I am learning in evangelism. But we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to look at one sentence of Scripture. I'm going to read one sentence of Scripture in Ephesians chapter 4, and look there in verse number 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Oh, there's not a period there, so we've got to continue on. I said a sentence, didn't I? Verse number 12, for the perfecting of the saints. Why did he give them? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Again, no period. Till we all come to the unity. We need to strive for unity. The unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ. Again, no period. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. And certainly there is opposition. And again, no period, so we're down to verse 15 now. But speaking the truth and love. There are some churches that have truth but no love. Some that have love but no truth. Christ is the perfect balance of truth and love. May grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. And again, no period. So the very last verse here for this full sentence, verse number 16. For whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacteth by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And that is one sentence of Scripture. So now you can see why we would struggle in Greek class and diagramming a sentence. And uh, you'd probably struggle with that in English too. But uh, tremendous truths here in Ephesians chapter 4. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that your word is eternal. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. There are those that despise your word, those that oppose your word, those that neglect your word, but your word stands. Lord, I praise you that we have your word. Lord, thank you for the church and uh, Lord, thank you for this local church. Lord, there is, uh, out of all the hundreds of churches I've been in, there's no church that's made a bigger impact in my life than Faith Baptist Tabernacle. Lord, thank you for this church. Thank you for these dear folks and for our visitors today. And thank you, Lord, for the Bruner family. Lord, and what you've done through them on the mission field. And we pray that you continue to have your hand of power and protection upon them and, and use them as, uh, as uh, they're here in the States uh, these next several months. And Lord, thank you so much for the privilege it is uh, for our church to support them. And, and Lord, as uh, you've gathered us here for this time, Lord, we'll never be gathered quite like this again. Lord, all of us in this room for this moment, and you have a specific purpose that you want to accomplish in each of our hearts. And so I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would do what I cannot, and that you would speak to each and every one of us, and that you would draw us nearer to you by us being here today. Lord, exalt yourself, exalt your word, I pray in Christ's name, amen. 
I think of this 10 years in evangelism, and I mention it in my prayer, that one of the greatest blessings in my life has been Faith Baptist Tabernacle. This is the place where I got saved. This is the place where I got baptized. Uh, it was uh, uh, probably the second row or so where I surrendered my life to the Lord and when I surrendered to be an evangelist. Yeah, this is the, the pulpit that I preached my first message in a church from. And, and so many memories uh, have taken place and life-changing things have been done through Faith Baptist Tabernacle throughout the years and people that have poured their lives into me. Uh, this church has been used in a great way in many other people's lives as well, and not only mine, but uh, I think of my life and how God has blessed me with some rocks, just some dependable things, and, and Faith Baptist is a rock in our lives. Uh, it's just a faithful place uh, that we can depend upon. The, uh, the, the ministry of the evangelist is so fluid. Uh, every week is different. Every day is different. Some of you, you have nine to five jobs. We don't. Uh, we don't know what's going to take place uh, each week and, uh, and how things are going to happen. And, and uh, it's, it's exciting uh, to see God at work and, and uh, moving in different ways. But, but this has been a faithful place for us to lean upon. I think of, of course, Pastor Rogers, 30 years here. He's been a rock in my life. Uh, my mom and dad, uh, godly people, and they've been a rock in my life. Uh, I lost one of the rocks in my life this year, uh, just uh, a month or so ago, which was my grandmother in San Leandro. She passed away, and, and she was a rock in my life. And, uh, and out of all of those rocks, the greatest rock uh, that, uh, that, you know, humanly speaking, is my wife. And uh, I'm thankful for the ministry of, of evangelism and serving with her. Uh, it takes a special woman to be an evangelist's wife. Uh, this is a unique ministry. Not many wives can do this. It really takes a special grace uh, from God to be an evangelist's wife. And, and uh, she's such an encouragement to me. And, and there's no way that I would be able to do this ministry without her. Uh, this is, uh, I'm just, I told the Lord uh, years ago before I ever, maybe when I was in college, I said, Lord, if you'd give me 10 years, uh, if you just give me 10 years to serve you in this way. And, uh, and it's kind of like, then you can take me home, do whatever you want to do. But I just, Lord, I love to have 10 years. And uh, now we've hit it. And so uh, I don't know if I'm going to die tomorrow. I'm not sure what's going to happen with that. But, but uh, I'm in it for life, by the way. I, I'm not, I have no plans. Uh, I have no desire to do anything else in life than be an evangelist. Uh, this is God's calling on my life. But there's no way I could do it without my wife. It's amazing how much she has sacrificed uh, you'll never know uh, the, the things. I mean, I think about when she was working a job and, and all that I put her through. Uh, I remember one time we, uh, a pastor was getting to know us and uh, invited us over to, to his house. And through many things, we just kind of hit it off and kept talking. And we talked till 4 a.m. Uh, and Megan had to be at work at 8 a.m. And she was there uh, at work. Uh, her body was present. I'm not sure where her mind might have been that day. But uh, she was there, and, uh, and that opened up tremendous opportunities for us uh, with her sacrifice on that. And I'm thankful for uh, the rock God's given me and my wife. And, of course, the greatest rock of all is God. God could take all of those things away from me, but he will always still be there. And uh, I'm thankful for the Lord uh, most of all. And this ministry of evangelism, I would love to, uh, there's much that I could say about an evangelist. There are some things I would like to talk about. Uh, and we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 5 and uh, just flip the page over and uh, look at verse number 22. Uh, it says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. And all the husbands said, don't say anything. Uh, <laughs> be wise in that. No, in verse 21, it says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So the wives and husband, you know, they submit to God. And uh, it says, as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let their wives be to their own husbands and everything. And then tremendous statement, verse number 25. Husbands, love your wives. How? Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water of the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And so God says to us, husbands, you love your wife as I love the church. You think about how much does God love the church? And you think of churches as a whole, but I think of the local church, how much God loves this church. He gave himself for it. When I go into a church as an evangelist, my, 
My mindset many times is to think about God's love that he has for this local church where I'm going to be ministering in. There is such a great love God has for the church, and, and he says, you have that same love for your wife, even as I have loved the church and have given myself for it. The church is extremely near to God's heart. It's extremely important to God. And as you and I grow in, in the Christian walk, the church is going to become more valuable to us. We're going to love what he loves, and we're going to love being in church. Now, I'm thankful that uh, I'm probably in church more than anybody in this room. Uh, I've gone to more services this year than anybody, and I'm thankful for that. And I'm responsible for that. At the judgment seat of Christ, I've been given a lot. Too much is given, much is required. And I think about being in church, and I love being in church. I'm thankful uh, for uh, the church, and, and God loves the church. And, and because he loves it so much, what has he given to the church? We see in Ephesians chapter 4, he's given gifts to the church. Look there in verse number 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets. Now, the apostles and prophets were foundational gifts. The apostles uh, were those that had seen Christ, that, uh, that were appointed by Christ. Uh, they were foundational gifts. The prophets, they foretold of God's word. Uh, we now have the complete canon of scripture, and, and so we don't foretell of God's word. We tell forth God's word. And in Ephesians chapter 2, you can flip the next page over, and it talks about, and are built upon, Ephesians 2.20, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So today we do not have apostles and prophets. Those were foundational gifts that God gave uh, to, for the church. So now what do we have left? We have evangelists and some pastors and teachers, and these are the building up of the church. Uh, the building up of the work of Christ. And, and uh, the, uh, the pastors and teachers could be as one. And then we have evangelists. Now, three times in Scripture is the, the title evangelist given. And even in Scripture, three times is the word preacher. And we talk about preachers, and, uh, and I'm, and I'm going to kind of, I don't know if vent is the right word, but uh, I, as, as I think about our ministry, there's some obstacles that we've had uh, when it comes to evangelism, and that is that people don't believe that we should be doing this, that our gift is not in existence today, or that the gift of the evangelist is not, uh, is not what we're called to be doing, uh, that the gift, they have a misconception about the gift of the evangelist to the church. And the one that is called into question is not uh, the pastors and teachers. The one that's called into question is the evangelist. And uh, we've had, uh, I've had discussions with different pastors and and uh, there's uh, some uh, pastors that believe that uh, the evangelist uh, is just a soul winner. That's all he is and nothing more. Uh, he needs to be a soul winner. And of course, in the very name of the evangelist is a heralder of the gospel. So that is a part of his life, that he is to be a soul winner. He needs to be about the gospel of Christ. But you have to negate Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, all the way to verse 16 to say he's just a soul winner. Because he's not just given as a soul winner, he's given as a gift to the church, to believers. He has a ministry to the church. Someone uh, was reading an evangelist book recently, and they talked about how the, the evangelist has a gospel to the sinners. Uh, of course, we know that, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But then there's the gospel to the saints. The gospel of the sinners is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. The gospel of the saints is the life of Christ through them that Christ has lived out through us. And so there is this aspect of revival and getting back to normal Christianity. Uh, there are many people that believe that the evangelist is just a soul winner. Then there's many people that believe that the evangelist uh, is just a church planter. Uh, many believe that. Uh, uh, John MacArthur, uh, he said, that, uh, he said in, in uh, one of his uh, commentaries, the evangelist... The New Testament picture of the evangelist is a man who, go, who goes from place to place where the gospel has not been preached. He preaches Christ, leads people to faith in him, and starts a little group of believers. He teaches them doctrines, appoints elders, and moves on to the next place. He is basically a planter of churches. The New Testament evangelist is not a person who comes, on, comes to town for a week of meetings and then leaves. His work isn't finished until he has founded a church. Now, there are many people that believe that, but that's not scriptural. The evangelist in the Bible that's named the evangelist is Philip, and Philip never planted a church. 
Now, everywhere you see him, some people say, well, the evangelist, if he would just stay home, just stay at his own home church, then we could see revival. But the evangelist isn't called to stay home. We see the evangelist Philip, and we don't have time to go through all that, but every time you see Philip, he's in a different place. An evangelist is itinerant. Uh, he's going from place to place. And for me, I, the call and other evangelists would say this, we can't sit still. After three weeks in the same church, I'm ready to go. Uh, some pastors have told me, this even last year, a pastor was telling me, he says, Tim, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you go from place to place, from church to church. And I said, Pastor, I don't know how you do it. And staying with the same people every week. <laughs> Uh, I don't have that gift. I don't have that calling. Uh, and, and God's gifted me. God's called me in a different way than what a pastor's called. Sometimes I, I sit back and I'm amazed uh, when pastor does a, a funeral or a, we had a, uh, a, a renewal of the vows. And I'm just amazed at how he handles that or, or in some of the counseling sessions that I've been able to sit in. And, and I'm just amazed. Well, that's, that's God's gift. Uh, God's gifted him in those ways. That's God's calling on his life. And, and so uh, people have a, uh, a various view of this matter of the evangelist, and that's in our circles as well that, that we travel in. And so people don't use evangelists. Uh, there are many evangelists that uh, have, have had a bad name and have hurt the cause of Christ. Uh, there's so much I want to say I need to move on, but uh, I, I, in 10 years I've been around, and, and uh, there's uh, people that call themselves evangelists that aren't evangelists. And I, I would hate to think that some pastors view on the evangelist is from people that aren't really called to be an evangelist. There's a, uh, I remember being at a conference and this pastor who was without a church at the time, he got up and he says, I'm evangelist so-and-so and I'm available for camps and, you know, missions conference. He lists all these things. We're just introducing ourselves, you know, I mean, we just need to give our name in the church and not, that's about it. But he's, you know, doing a whole promo during that thing. And, and, and I'm thinking, ay, yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, and, as I, and, and, I, and sometimes I'll, get, I'll go and ask for advice from evangelists, and, and I didn't know this guy that well. And I thought, you know, I'm not even going to ask him for advice about evangelism because I don't believe that he's, he has the gift of the evangelist. Two years later, he's back pastoring. That's his gift. That's where he needs to be. He was without a church, so he calls himself an evangelist. And it's hard when you're in between ministries. You know, what do you do? But they don't have the gift, and there's a specific gift that God has given uh, different ones, different men to have that gift of the evangelist. And, and of course, God has given me that gift as of the evangelist. And, and, uh, and so there's some opposition that we have faced, some misconceptions. I've been misunderstood many times. And, uh, and it, was, uh, it was a struggle getting started in evangelism. Uh, many people who, would, who didn't know me that well would say, so Tim, you're just doing this right now because you're waiting for a church. And I'm like, no, this is God's call in my life. I'm in it for the long haul. Uh, and different ones have said, oh, we want you to be our next pastor. And uh, one, one church was on to me for several different times. And finally, I told the pastor, I said, I'll do it. I'll do it for three weeks. And, uh, well, and, and he says, that sounds more like a, a revival meeting. And, and I said, yeah, that's what it will be. Because uh, that's my passion. That's what God's put in my heart. And, and so uh, people have, have misunderstood us and, and misunderstood the calling God has placed on my life. And and what is an evangelist? Uh, of course, he is about the gospel, but, but he's also to reach those uh, uh, for revival and getting back to normal Christianity. Uh, this is, there's many things, lessons that I've learned. There's so much I want to share with you, but I need to move on about the evangelist. Um, some uh, have taught liking the evangelist like a, a, a surgeon. So you have your general doctor, your general practitioner. He knows a lot about everything. And, uh, and you see him most of the time, but then you might need something special, and so you need to see a surgeon. Uh, and that surgeon, is that's his specialty. That's his, his heart. He, he doesn't know all the other stuff that a doctor needs to know. He has this specialty, and that's what an evangelist is like for the church. He's like a surgeon for the church. There's certain burdens and, and heartbeats God has given me. I, I don't have a, a big, huge burden, a, a, a big, uh, uh, I guess, calling for all these other things. There's just specific things God has placed in my heart. My uh, pastor said to me years ago, he says an evangelist is, is uh, narrow focused. And uh, oh, he nailed it. Because I don't see, I don't look at the big picture a lot of times. When I'm in a, in a week of meetings, to me, all of life stops. Then there, there's nothing more important than what's going on in that week. And, uh, and that's like with the surgeon. You're going through the surgery. He has his full focus upon that. And, uh, and so that's how I am with, uh, with evangelism. But I want to share uh, five lessons that I am learning in evangelism. Five lessons that I'm learning in evangelism. Now, this is going to be topical. I'm not much of a topical preacher. 
more uh, of the exegetical, but uh, this is going to be topical. And five lessons that I'm learning. Now, I say learning lest I, uh, I give the, uh, the connotation that I've already learned these lessons, that I've already passed this course, that I've mastered it, that I've graduated from these lessons. Uh, these are lessons that I learn in, in greater depth, and, and uh, God continues to work on me. This calling of evangelism, of course, there's been opposition in our lives, a uh, uh, misunderstanding. And, and if you were to ask me, uh, what is the greatest obstacle in being an evangelist? Because a lot of churches don't use evangelists. Uh, out west, it's even more difficult than back east or midwest. And I would have probably have told you is that pastors don't, don't understand the gift of the evangelist. They don't use evangelists. But that's not my greatest obstacle in evangelism. Do you know what my greatest obstacle in evangelism is? Me. Lesson number one. <laughs> my greatest obstacle in evangelism is me. The greatest hindrance to the last 10 years has been me. The greatest hurt to our ministry the last 10 years has been me. I have been uh, the greatest obstacle. I relate to what Paul said in Romans chapter 7, for I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. There's no righteousness in me apart from Christ. There's nothing good in me. The Bible tells us what's within us. In Mark 7, 21, for from within... Out of the heart of man proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetous, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. That's what's within your heart and that's within my heart apart from Christ. We have no righteousness. I do not deserve to preach another message. I do not deserve to live another day. I don't deserve another opportunity. Every day is a gift. Every time I get up to preach, it is a gift. At any moment, God could stop giving me a voice to sing or giving me a voice to preach. I didn't say take away to stop giving it. He could stop giving me that voice. He's done it with other preachers that I know. He could do it with me. This, this calling that I have, I was telling Megan of a, of a guy that I knew when I was a teenager, and he said he believed that he was called to, to be an evangelist. And he says, the Lord's not coming back until I'm an evangelist because I'm called to be an evangelist. And, uh, and, you know, we've all said some stupid things. That was a stupid thing he said. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't have any, like, God, you have to put me in advance. I have to do these things. No, every day is a gift. Uh, I don't have any right. Uh, this, is, this is just a, a privilege to be able to serve the Lord. And I, and I soak up every time. <laughs> I soak up every time I get to go up and, and to preach uh, God's Word and to be invited to different churches and things. Uh, years ago, I was at a church and it was a long weekend, and, and uh, we were just exhausted. I was exhausted. First time I was at this church and preached Sunday, Sunday morning, and Sunday afternoon, uh, you know, we go back to the church for the evening service, and my attitude is this. I want to get back to the place where we're staying. It was about a three- or four-hour drive that Sunday night, and I said, I want to get back to the place where we're staying. I want to go to bed. I'm tired. I'm weary. I'm worn out. And I'm praying uh, in the car with Megan. We're praying, going to go to the service. And I said, Lord, you know, I'm asking for God to bless the service. And as I'm praying and asking God to bless, God is convicting my heart about my attitude. Tim, you're being selfish. You're being lazy. You're being prideful. This is my church. This is my service. And maybe I want to do more than what you're even expecting. Maybe I, there's something that, that I want to do in this service than, you, than you're not even thinking. And, and as I was praying with Megan, God's convicting my heart, and I went from praying to confessing. I <laughs> said, so God, I confess to you my pride and my selfishness and my laziness. This is your church. I have a message prepared, but you just take over. You do whatever you want to do in this service. And that night, I, I don't even all know what I said. I, I, I had the text, and, and uh, God just, just did it. And that night was a great night. And the church invited us back for uh, some meetings. The next morning, I'm in prayer, and I'm in an intense time with the Lord in prayer. And then I'm thanking Him for what He did the night before. And then opening the door for a, a future meeting. And, and, uh, and that, uh, that, as I'm praying, the Lord begins to show me, Tim, the hindrance last night was not going to be the church. The hindrance to what I wanted to do last night would have been you if you didn't get right. And I wonder, I don't want to know, but I wonder how many times I've hindered God working in a service because of me. God wants to work. He wants to do far beyond what you and I can even imagine. But we're the ones that hinder him. And so my greatest obstacle is me. Uh, that's my greatest hindrance. That's my greatest problem is me. Uh, lesson number two. 
I must live by faith. You see, there's no other way this ministry can go on except by faith. Every month we're wondering, and not really wondering, but uh, we, don't, we cannot see how we're going to make it. Uh, financially, what are we going to be doing this month? Where are we going to be at? I mean, even just uh, this past week, we uh, have been invited to go to Pennsylvania and bought tickets and didn't sure how all that's going to happen. And, and the Lord just you know, provides and works those things out. And we have to live by faith. And faith takes risks. And you have to take risks and you have to step out on faith. I remember when Megan was working at the job at 7-Up and, and, uh, and God laid on our hearts, you got to break off that job. Many times I would go on myself and uh, one pastor in Arizona, he says, Tim, I know you tell me that you're married, but I've never met your wife. I've had you here several times. And he says, I want the next time to have you. I want to see your wife. And, uh, and so, you know, the next time we, we had broken off the job, got to see her and things. And, and uh, you know, God is, has opened up so many more doors of opportunity because Megan's with me. I've had meetings where the, uh, I know that they've asked me because of her. Uh, you know, that they, I, we want to spend time with the pastor's wife. We want to spend time with Megan. Uh, so we want, you, want to have you guys come back. And, and uh, I know where my, my bread is butter. And so I'm thankful for my wife. And then, you know, for us to, to break off the job. And now we have no consistent income. And I have been starving. Uh, being in evangelism, I've gotten so skinny. Uh, by the way, if you want a weight loss program, don't travel in a car and, and uh, not be able to cook your own food and all that kind of stuff. And uh, it, it's difficult. But I, you know, I, God has taken care of us through all these years, and everything, everything I've done, She's always been with me. Uh, even I just share this. Uh, you know, this last week we were invited to Pennsylvania. I knew they were flying me out. I didn't know that they would pay for Megan's ticket. God says, "I want you to have Megan come with you," and I said, "Okay." And uh, I told Megan, I said, I don't know if they're going to pay for your ticket, but we're paying for it. I, you know, God wants, us, wants you to go. And I clicked purchase, and I, when I clicked purchase, I said, by faith. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, talking to the pastor, they said, oh, we're going to take care of that too. Uh, we're going to take care of both of your tickets. And, and uh, you know, I, I don't want to be by myself. I want to be with her. She's, uh, God's so blessed us as a team together, and, and that's taken faith. Uh, in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 58, and he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. And so we must live by faith. Uh, you see, faith sees the invisible. Faith hears the inaudible. Faith believes the impossible. Uh, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We limit what God does through us and through our church by the sins of unbelief. How are we to live this Christian life? The same way we started it, by faith. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We start the Christian life by faith. By, we realize that we're a sinner, that we need Jesus Christ to save us, that our sin has punishment, and, and that punishment is eternal separation from God and lake of fire, and Jesus Christ paid the price for the punishment of our sins when he died upon the cross and shed his blood, and then he rose again, conquering sin and conquering the grave. And we can have eternal life by putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. As Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I got saved by faith. And I am to live this Christian life by faith. You see, there's something maybe that God's put into your heart and you're, you're vacillating on it. I don't know what it is, but there's something that God is saying, you need to take, take a step out on faith. You need to take a risk. You need to trust me. And there are times where I've, uh, it seems like there was nothing to lean on. And I'm like, God, I have nothing. There's absolutely nothing I can lean on. No arm of the flesh. And God's always been there. Every time I put my trust, my faith in him, he's always been there. He's never let me down. I've never regretted trusting and obeying God. This life, uh, the Christian life, takes faith. And so I'm to live this life of evangelism by faith. Some evangelists have gotten out of evangelism because they didn't trust God. They didn't take risks. They didn't have faith. And I don't want to suffer from the sins of unbelief. I've done that enough. I want to have faith in God. And even through all the COVID time, oh, how God took care of us through it all. He's so faithful. He's greater than uh, you know, I, man, there's so much I could share with you. Uh, you know, you go to a church and, and, uh, and, and, you know, the offering might be lower than what, 
you might be expecting, and I, uh, I don't really expect you know, anything. It's if you have no expectations, you won't you know, be disappointed. I think of one uh, evangelist that was in evangelism for some years. His wife, the very first check she got, to, they got in evangelism. She says, uh-oh, we're in trouble. And I'm so glad that Megan's never said that. Now, she might have thought that, but uh, she's never said it. And, uh, and, and you know what? God has taken care of us. We were drilled in the evangelist class by evangelist Ron Comfort. You look to God to meet your needs. Not to individuals or churches. God's bigger than all of this. God's bigger than the independent Baptist. God's bigger than California. God's bigger than anything you and I will ever face. And so I can have faith. We can have faith. We can trust him. Lesson number three, I am nothing without prayer and a prayer life. Nothing. I have nothing without prayer. And, I, and we quote the verse, John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that believeth in me, or he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Oh, but we think we can do some things. We think we can live our life without God, and, and, it's, and it's shown or it's proved by our prayerlessness. As uh, I believe it's Chess Carr that said, a day without prayer is a boast against God. God, I don't need you today. No, we, we have to have God. We are nothing without him. Oh, there's the arm of the flesh. There's doing ministry in the flesh. And and this ministry that we have, and I'm I'm not saying I've done many times, I've done ministry in the flesh, but when it comes to preaching, I don't think that I've ever preached in the flesh. Uh, I mean, I've been, there's times where I've been closer to God than other times, but but, uh, I can't do this in my own strength. I mean, it is impossible. Uh, The Lord has shown that to me time and again. I've done other ministries in the flesh, but but here, God says, you can do nothing without me. It is more important to be prepared than prepared. It is more important that, that you have your heart right than to have everything else in line. Uh, Ian Bounds talked about that, that, uh, that, it, that a prepared heart makes a prepared sermon. It is better to have a prepared heart than to have a prepared sermon. I'm nothing without prayer. And in caution, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, not that we are sufficient of, our, of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. If anything is going to happen through the ministry of, of angels Tim Schmidt and Megan, it's going to be God. Anything good that has happened in these 10 years, it's all of God. It's none of me. It's when God has, has done it, when God has taken over. And I am nothing without prayer and the ministry of prayer. Uh, my grandmother who passed away, that was her ministry, the ministry of prayer. And I was amazed at the funeral of how vast her prayer life was. Things, and, and even times when we were talking with her, missionaries that, that she just met, the church didn't support, but, but she was praying for them. And, uh, and, and, and they would write and things and, and oh, how God would get a hold of, or how she would get a hold of the ear of God in her prayer life. And, and that so challenged me that I need to have that same ministry too the ministry of prayer. I never ask a pastor, can I come preach in your church? I've never asked that. I've never said that. Can I come preach in your church? I pray. God put me upon, uh, I have my open dates and I pray through those open dates. God fill those open dates. I had a period of last uh, six weeks where I had one Sunday that was open. I said, God, uh, you know, put it upon some pastor's heart. I need to fill that one Sunday or whatever you, wherever you want us to go. And and a uh, pastor called me up and said, uh, Tim, do you have this certain Sunday open? And it was the exact Sunday I was praying for and, and had open. And God just worked all of that out. And he's done that time and time and time again. Because I want to be where God wants me. I don't want to force myself any places uh, uh, where God does not want me to be. And, and that goes alongside with prayer. Uh, without prayer, I have nothing. I have no ministry. Without the ministry of prayer of our church, we have no ministry. Uh, God says that, 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 are the, that his house is to be called a house of prayer the, to the preachers. He says that we are to give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. I exhort, therefore, first of all, supplications, prayer, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, 1 Timothy 2.1. And so prayer is, is to be just as natural as breathing is to us physically. It ought to be to us spiritually. That all throughout the day we're in communion with God, that we're talking with God. I'm nothing without prayer and a prayer life. Lesson number four. My greatest seasons with the Lord have been in desiring to exalt Him and being dead to self. This is something the last, I don't know, five years or so God has so emphasized to me. 
some years ago, we had uh, David Gibbs here of Christian Law Association. Uh, we had our California Capital Connection meeting. The pastor asked me to do song leading and lead the music. And, and I prayed over the music. I prayed over the songs that God would want us to have. I prayed over, uh, you know what, specials and things. And I'm like, Lord, and my whole attitude was, Lord, how can I make you look good? How can I exalt you tonight? Uh, what, what, what would please you in this service? And I believe that that service was single-handedly the best service I've ever been in uh, at Faith Baptist. Uh, David Gibbs preached on humility. And, and, uh, and I remember being up here, God called an audible. We had all the pastors come up and, and uh, sing, I'd rather have Jesus. And, and, uh, you know, and, and my uh, friend, uh, many of you know him, David Welch, he, he texts me while I'm up here. He, he texts me and he says, Tim, whatever you're doing right now, keep it up. God's using you. And I thought, what am I doing? Oh, I'm seeking to exalt God. I'm seeking to, to, to get him, to make him look good in front of the people. And then being dead to self. I mean, the two greatest ministries, two greatest things we've ever been a part of, one was the tent meeting last year in October. Uh, we've seen God do some great things. Another one was, and I didn't share it on Sunday morning, but I've shared it on Wednesday night, to, uh, preaching open revival in Ambassador Baptist College. I told Megan on that Thursday, I said, when do we say it? When do we say that it's revival? Oh, God moved in a tremendous way. But both of those times were some of the greatest death to self I've ever had. And when I think of those meetings, I do think of the services, but more than that, I think of my prayer times that God had with me. I think about the, the struggling and, and uh, the crying and, and the wrestling and, and all that went on to, uh, before getting into those services and being a part of those things. Isaiah fifty-seven fifteen is the heartbeat of my life. For thus saith the high and lofty one, that inhabit the eternity whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, and with him also does the contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. When I think about my life with God, I think about being a glove. I have here a, a work glove, and if I were to uh, say to this glove, uh, all right, glove, get to work. Uh, you know, go, go uh, help uh, uh, break down some of those branches. And it's just going to sit there. There's no life in there. Or if, or if I, this represented my life, all right, Tim, be an evangelist. All right, Tim, walk in victory. Tim, do what's right. I can't. I have nothing. I'm dead. I, I have nothing apart from what Christ, Christ comes in, puts power behind all of that. And he's the one that, that moves when, when there needs to be movement. And I think of my life being a glove in God's hand. That, I, I, you know, that when God moves, I move. That when what God wants, I want to do what God wants to do. I have messages that I've preached many times before, but Megan will tell you, they're always different. Because maybe God wants me to emphasize something else to another church than I did a previous church some months back. I don't know what's going on in the churches. I don't know what's going on in people's hearts, but God knows everything. And so when he moves, I want to move. And here's the thing. God's voice is not loud all the time. As a matter of fact, it's rarely loud. What is it? It happened with Elijah. It was in that still, small voice. His voice is so, so, so still, so quiet as a whisper that everything else in life needs to be needs to be uh, drowned out and just focused in on that, on that little whisper because sometimes God grabs me like this, but other times it's just a little flick, just a little bit. And I'll be like, okay, Lord, is this now? Do this now? And, uh, and, and every time I've listened to that, oh, how God has worked in, in services uh, and just taken over. And I, I, I want to be that glove in God's hand because I am nothing without him. Uh, and I want to exalt him. It's about him. He must increase. I must decrease. There's nothing good in me. I must be dead to self, but alive into Christ. Ephesians or uh, Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Now, not I, but Christ, which liveth in me. Uh, in the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 6, 14, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. My greatest seasons with the Lord haven't even been in church services. It's been in my quiet time. 
It's been in those times of, of, uh, of seeking to exalt him uh, in my quiet time and being dead to self in that wrestling. And then lastly, the power of God is one of the hardest things to get and one of the easiest things to lose. The power of God is one of the hardest things to get and one of the easiest things to lose. You see, there's a price to have God's anointing. There's a price to, to have a, a sharpness to ministry, a sharpness to preaching and all of these things. And, and that price is, is paid in the prayer closet. It's paid by living a holy life, being separate from sin, separated unto God. It's a price of being dead to self. Luke 9, 27, he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. There's a price. You see, we don't just show up to church and, uh, and you know, without prayer, without spending time with God and expect great things to happen. I was at a church uh, some, uh, some months ago and, and uh, the church, there was nothing special about the church service that, uh, that had happened, but all those songs meant so much to me. Uh, the message, it wasn't the best message I've ever heard in my life, but oh, God spoke to my heart. And, you know, it just, it was like a regular service in, in many people's uh, minds, but, uh, but that night, that service was so special to me. And then I thought, you know what, it's because right now I'm sensitive to the Lord. Right now I'm, I'm seeking to Him with all my heart. And, and, uh, and God's made those, that, that song service so much more precious to me. Sometimes, you know, oh, we need to have different music. We need to have different things happening. No, you know who we need? We need God. We need God in our lives personally. We need God in the churches. We need the power of God. But you see, it's, when we get it, it's one of the easiest things to lose. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed of the day of redemption. That meaning of grieve is to make sorrowful, to afflict with sadness, to cause grief. See, God is so intimate and so personal with you that your life affects Him. You can grieve the Holy Spirit of God. God will work in a meeting, and we're not the ones that, that are... He, God's, God's not the one that shuts it down. We are. I think of my friend, a, a pastor friend was at a meeting back east, and he says, Tim, God was moving in an unusual way. The message that was preached, he says, it was just anointed. God's presence was there. He says, the altar's seemed to be filled, and, and, uh, and God was just moving. He says, Tim, I really thought this was going to be the first time I was going to see revival break out. But immediately the song leader got up and sang a rousing song, uh, and, the, and the spirit was quenched. It was done. That was the height of the meeting. I talked to another man, another preacher friend of mine that was at that meeting, and he says, Tim, I was part of the grieving of the spirit. He says, God told me to go forward at the invitation, and I refused. He says, I helped to grieve the Holy Spirit that day. God wants to send revival. They're, they're, I, I don't believe that the greatest days we've seen with God are done. I believe that, you know, we're still breathing. We, we still have something God wants to do in and through our lives individually and as a church. And I, I believe that God wants to do some great things. But we're the ones that are going to hinder it. And when that power of Christ comes, it's so easy to lose it because of sin. A wrong thought, a wrong deed, a wrong word that is said. I think of the men's meeting, and one pastor was sharing with me that after one of the men's meetings, another pastor talked to him about something that was gossip, and, and it just quenched his spirit. And oh, how that hurts my heart. <laughs> you know, I don't want to hinder what God wants to do with the men's meeting. I don't want to hinder what God wants to do through our ministry. But the Holy Spirit is grieved when we sin against him. And then 1 Thessalonians 5.19 says, quench not the spirit. The word quench means to put the fire out. You see, there was a time in your life where you had a passion for prayer. You had a passion for God's Word, where, where the, the song service meant a lot to you because your heart was tender and sensitive to the Lord. And, and when you read His Word, you were getting so much out of it, but now it's grown cold and calloused, where you desired to go to church, but now you're just kind of drudgingly coming to church. The fire's been put out. The fire's been quenched. God wants to revive you out of that. He's in the reviving business. He wants to, uh, to, to put that fire back in you. I think of... Psalm 51, I was reading through that uh, the other day and noticing all of the personal pronouns of Psalm 51. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. You could, I circled through all of those personal pronouns. And oh, how our sin is so personal against God. 
how intimate we can be with the Lord. And we can quench the Spirit. We can grieve the Spirit. I believe that God is wanting to do some great things in our day. He's wanting to exalt Himself in even greater ways than you and I know. Darker the night, the greater the light. Oh yeah, this is a bad time. I think of one, uh, one of our uh, state senators says, as you've heard, as California goes, so goes the nation. He says, what if God would entrust us with revival? As California goes, so goes the nation. What if it starts here? What if it's here at, at, at Faith Baptist? What if it starts with me or it starts with you? We're not the, God's not the, the problem. We are. We're the ones that are going to hinder it. A man I never met but has had a great influence on my life is Leonard Ravenhill. Leonard Ravenhill was an evangelist uh, uh, for many years, and, and he was a revivalist. He would talk about uh, uh, getting right with God. There would be great movements of God, and he would spend, uh, he would spend 8, 10, 12 hours in prayer with the Lord and, and get, uh, get some, so just, he had an anointing upon his life. And, uh, and every time I hear him preach, my heart is just stirred as I listen to other uh, recordings. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Caleb Garraway, gave, uh, put this uh, together, and uh, if we have that video, and I think this has been shown once before, but uh, it talks about uh, this matter of revival and our need uh, for revival. And uh, Leonard Ravenhill was a great man of God. And he speaks, I remember he, he said one time, he says, America cannot fall because America's already fallen. Things that we see right now, he was already seeing in the 60s and 70s. He was already preaching against. And it's time for the church of God. It's time for the people of God. It's time for an evangelist to, uh, in California to wake up and to pay the price for personal revival. Let's watch this three or four minute clip. 